Well, thank you all for joining and coming to this water quality session. Uh, it's really a great honor for me to be part of HIPAC and to be able to uh, talk to this, this valuable area of HIPAC. Uh, this is actually <clears throat> stemming from development that we had done a number of years ago and had not really brought it back to the forefront. So it had been buried in the background. And I don't know if you came to trainings last year or so, um, this was not part of the trainings, but this year we want to bring it back in and, uh, and see what we can do to gain uh, actually a better perspective. So it's kind of to cast on to you what we've been doing so far and to hear from you what we could be doing better to, to advance this. And I, so I really appreciate your, your feedback on that and everybody answering some of that, you know, that question and giving me a better comprehension. I think that's going to be very valuable for us um, instead of just going in with a narrow view of okay we have sensors and okay we have somebody with legacy understanding now what do we do with it? Um, yeah, for me, I, I did the work of out there sampling with water quality sensors, you know, mowing the lawn on a boat with a little flow through that I made myself out of PVC and I'd record the Excel files, well text files, and then bring that into MATLAB and use my GPS data and create maps as well as I could and I did it all by hand. Uh, all the work I did with ADCPs as well, measuring discharge, um, uh, doing surface flow maps and models was all done by MATLAB and I really had no other tools for doing this and that it was really uh, limiting my ability um, and I've looked at what USGS is doing today uh, just as recently as about six months ago had some meetings with those folks on looking at discharge measurements and the kind of work they're doing and what the state of the art and technology for turbidity mapping with the ADCPs as well which I was that was a big effort of mine was to try to make maps of sediment flux from ADCP data. Uh, my dissertation project, I worked out in Siberia and, and mapped one of the largest rivers of the world that flows north to the Arctic Ocean. I was really optimistic going in, thinking I'll go in with turbidity sensors, I'll make cross sections of backscatter, I'll develop a correlation, and I'll be able to say how much sediment is flowing through, and we're doing samples and everything. At the end of the day, I can never get a correlation between the two, and it was very frustrating for me. Um, and so now being at the, you know, kind of the helm here with HIPAC, I'm in a, in a position of advantage to try to see what we can do with a stronger group of programmers and also with access to some of the resources of Xylem um, to see what, what we can do in the broader scale of things. Uh, so I'll present to you some of the stuff we have completed, what we've done, what we have available. Uh, when I started at HIPAC about eight months ago, one of my old customers from Sonar Days said, oh, you're at HIPAC. Actually, we're using it for water quality mapping. We bought a 6600 from YSI. <laughs> we go out there and we collect the data and we just did a project in a canal and there was a concern about thermal uh, plumes coming into the canal and trying to figure out where these thermal plumes are coming from, you know, and using the temperature as kind of a tracer to, to back calculate. And so he went out there with a 6600 and he did like he would on a, on a single beam echo sounder survey of just going back and forth in this canal and mapping. So not only is he mapping the depth, but he's also mapping the parameters from the YSI 6600. And at the end of the day, he's able to make a bathymetry map and then also make a map of each of those parameters, just like the bathymetry map. So it's really easy to interpret. You know, you could put them as layers and even adjust the transparency and see with the bathymetry contours in the background and see the color of, you know, whether it's temperature, whether it's dissolved oxygen, whether it's pH, and do little overlays to do a quick analysis and <clears throat> As soon as, you, as soon as you did that, you could see from the pH and from the temperature very clearly this little channel of hot water coming in from the side that also had a pH characteristic to it that didn't correspond with the rest of the ambient water in that canal. And so it was clear as day where the effects, you know, where this plume was coming from. And he said it was really uh, it was super valuable. The EPA was able to look at the data and it, it registered right away. You know, and that was project completed. Very nice, easy, successful and a tool to present the information readily. Um, and I think there's a lot more we could be doing and, uh, and even furthering this. And so I'll show you some of what we've done also for the dredge applications, uh, monitoring turbidity, um, setting thresholds for alarms so the dredge operator sees right away when turbidity levels are exceeding threshold. Um, I'd like to look into some of the other technologies uh, from the wireless and remote control um, autonomous vehicles and such that a lot of them are now incorporating ADCPs as well. Uh, you know, you spoke about <clears throat> multiple sensors all on an autonomous vehicle and uh, it was about six months ago, maybe somewhere around there, University of New Hampshire visited with them 
they're running kind of like a little jet ski boat. Mm -hmm. They have an ADCP, they have a sub bottom profiler, they had a dual frequency echo sounder, um, uh, they had a side scan sonar and a multi beam, all on this little jet ski boat. It was a two pontoon, one man jet ski boat. He's got two computers on board. He's running, I think it was seven different software applications to acquire the data from all these sensors. He's got two monitors and he's out there in the cold of New Hampshire having to take off his gloves each time to open up and close and get each sensor started and running survey lines that he had programmed into this old relic interface, basically like a, like a Garmin that just had waypoints in it. And so he'd get up next to a waypoint, he'd have to take off his gloves, start up each of these sensors, make sure they're all recording, and they're all recording their own formats in different directories. And then he'd get to the end of the line and try to stop all his sensors, get to the next line and start them again. And we said, you know, it was just remarkable to be there from HiPAC and think people are still doing that. And of course, the university does a lot of teaching and training. They do two courses with HiPAC each year. You know, we said, you have access to the resources, so all you need to do is activate them. And so we visited them for an afternoon and just, you know, on our own, went down there, hooked up to their system, had a Wi-Fi connection out in the parking lot to their, their uh, vehicle, and got the interface all established on their monitors and put it all into HiPAC and showed them how you could set in survey lines. So in HiPAC, uh, I'll show you one example here. So if you're not too familiar, you can go in, and this, these slides and the lighting doesn't quite do things very much justice, but, but for example, you can have a, uh, <clears throat> a simple map interface such as this. You can have a background chart in there. You can have overlays with imagery from Google Earth, for example, and you can simply draw in your survey lines and tell HiPAC, okay, here's one survey line. Now make 20 more survey lines that are 10 feet apart, that are 200 feet apart, whatever you want to do, you can enter these into there. You can do curved survey patterns up and down a river channel, for example, tell HiPAC make multiple that are fixed spacing apart from each other. And the cool thing is, you go through the hardware setup in HiPAC, get all your sensors integrated, you test that the communication's working, and if this was a survey line here that was pre-programmed into HiPAC, so I drew that in, for example, normally it would be a straight line, this is actually one they drove, um, it would have a starting point and an ending point, and it'll make a little circle here and a circle there, and if you're not familiar with HiPAC, as soon as you drove up and you hit that first circle, it would turn on all your sensors that are set up and start recording, and you'd see it come up saying starting logging, it would draw a little arrow on here that shows this is the path you want to go down, and we've now developed all these drivers for autonomous control, like the Mavlink drivers and some proprietary autonomous navigation drivers. So whether you're on the boat and you just want to let the autopilot do it and you can sit and read a book or just watch the data and there's plenty to mess around with while you're on the boat versus driving. Um, yeah, the system can drive right down the line and when it gets to the end, it automatically turns off, well, it doesn't turn off the sonars necessarily, but stops logging, comes around to the next line and starts again, logging again. And instead of opening up all these windows and applications and all the proprietary formats, it's logging all the data together, all the time, stamps and the data sets are all synchronized. And at the end of the day, you can simply go in and, and <clears throat> view the data tabularly or as time series information. I think I should adjust the lighting in here. Let me know if it gets too strained and you can't see. But, uh, I think this is the... Oh, do you mind? Oh, thank you. Does that help some? I want everybody going to sleep after lunch, you know, but. <laughs> All right, well, maybe I'll just have to wave my hands a whole lot more and draw pictures in the sky. Well, I kind of prefer that to a whiteboard because I'm not very artistic. Ah, here, a little better, a little better. Yeah, you guys see okay? Excellent. So yeah, so here's an example of processing water quality. Um, right now, you know, it's been implemented with our single beam editor uh, system. So. Uh, our single beam editing package can be used. It's a, the way it's been viewed in HiPAC is why not? It's a, it's a single parameter that you want to make a map from. What's different from it being a bunch of depth soundings versus being a bunch of water quality parameters? You just load in the parameter and, and process the data, filter it, edit it how you want, edit the data set, and, uh, and generate a coverage map. And so we'll go through a real little review. So. 
Here, for example, is a, is a case study where we map some salinity in, in Mystic Harbor there in Connecticut. And so you can see the 31.1 over here, 31.0, 30.5, you know, so you can map it all out just like we would with a single beam echo sounder. We have ways of just presenting the data. This is just a data presentation after processing. So this is actually a, a surface that was created and you can tell HiPAC to show it as values color coded and with the values to so many decimal places as you may choose. Alternatively, you can produce a 10 model. So we can actually produce a little heat map of all those parameters. And so right away you can see this little hot spot there, you know, where it's 31.1 parts per thousand. You know, and over here is a little low area where it's, well, it doesn't look like it really affects the values in this data set. But in this case, that would be a low area. You know, maybe that's 30 parts per thousand. Or, sorry, all right, the scale's reversed. <laughs> so red is 30, down here, 31. So if you just look at the graph, you can actually pick out that information pretty readily, right? If I try to read into it too deeply, I can get confused, but just look at the image and you can pick all that out pretty quickly. And see how easy it is to interpret the information. Right there, you're seeing low salinity area. Now maybe this is fresh water upwelling from the bed, right? This could be water coming up from the bottom, fresh water. Over here is a, is a more saline area injection, right? Maybe this is a flood tide that's coming in through a channel. Right, and this was all collected, I think it was using a USV, um, probably the HiCat USV driving around in Mystic Harbor. So the data can be collected, can be processed and mapped in such a way. Here's another case of doing a temperature plot. So this is just looking at temperature. So from 28 to 29 degrees, I'm guessing that's uh, Celsius, not Fahrenheit. It's hard to drive the boat and take measurements in 28 degree Fahrenheit water, frozen. But here, right away, you can see the, the cooler water here and warmer water down at this end. And the cool thing, if you haven't worked with high pack much, that you can just draw a line across here and say, give me a profile, give me a transect through this area, and it'll produce this map right there. So you can see how much the salinity varied right along that length of, of uh, the transect. All right, so you're getting a little cross-section of temperature. And this, this data set was certainly collected, as it says, by a by a USV mowing the lawn out there with a hull mounted uh, sensor. So that was with the HiCat system at the Sontec facility. Um, here's an example of products, data products, you know, using side scan, bathymetry, and also uh, temperature. So you can overlay all those data parameters with background imagery. Uh, in this case, the side scans, you know, I'm a side scan guy, I've worked for side scan companies for 12 years. I think we could have gotten a better side scan image up there, Brock, but uh, <laughs> we'll work on that at some point. Uh, improve this image, but it's uh, more about showing what HiPAC can do with the data uh, that you collect with these systems. Um, yeah, one of the features here for, especially for dredge applications, so built into dredge pack, there is actually a turbidity monitoring uh, parameter in there. So as you're monitoring turbidity in your area, you can be looking at, at what the what the values are and, and you can set alarms at certain thresholds. So as soon as you start exceeding a certain threshold, so whether these are out at uh, moorings providing wireless data coming in, or if you have a USV out there that's continuously monitoring on the perimeter, uh, these are, it's all just read as a single time series of data from, <clears throat> from a device and you flag it as being turbidity data. And when it exceeds the threshold, bang, a little red light shows up on the dredge operator screen and lets them know your turbidity threshold's been exceeded. And it lets them know you really might want to consider shutting down before, before uh, you know, somebody else finds out or however it's regulated. Um, but it gives them the cue then to, to cease operations or at least be aware that, that you're causing a turbidity plume at that moment. And so maybe you want to change your operations. Uh, in some form or fashion. So here you can set your turbidity threshold. Uh, you can set it up so you can choose whether these are nephilometric turbidity units or uh, formazine turbidity units. So that's whether it's a white wavelength or is uh, ultraviolet, I believe, <coughs> wavelength turbidity measurement. And you can also be looking at a, so this is a live graph that's being shown too, the turbidity values during the operation. And so this red line would show what the threshold is uh, before they exceed that threshold. An alarm will trigger <clears throat> when they get above that. So if you're not familiar with hardware setup in high pack, 
So for example, with the YSI XO system, so it's a 6600 device, you can choose the XO driver here, you say where it's mounted. So for example, if this was on a USB and you maybe you have another sensor that's mounted onto your barge, or maybe you have like a little stilling well with a sensor in it as well, uh, not to use well and well, uh, but you can have those data sets coming in. So one maybe coming in by a serial, another maybe by ethernet through a serial uh, to ethernet splitter, you know, a little UDP to serial device. Uh, another one could be coming in wirelessly from the USB that's out there monitoring. And we can be recording the data from each of those devices. When you go to set up the driver, you're just simply clicking on here and you can load which parameters your device is uh, providing data from. And so we'll record all those parameters. So during your operation, then you can also, uh, well, you can also view the parameters and see what they're, uh, what they're showing in iPad. So we've got another one here. And bear How with me. Is that, um, combined hardware? Yes. Package in, in the what, what version of the package? That comes in, so typically we're selling Max, but I don't think you need Max for that. Carlos, Which is it? 15 to half and 15. Oh, 2015? So it goes back to 2015. Do you know what version is a the minimum they need for that? Is it high pack max or high pack max? Well, in all versions. It's in all versions. Combined hardware, yes. All right. For feature from 2015. Okay. Thank you. Does the single beam editor recognize that many parameters? Because I've I've cheated with other sensors in the past and used like a fake driver to record something and treated it like single beam. So will this this will, this will track, can you open it up in the editor? Let's say if you go back to that other XO driver. You know you had let's say you had five different parameters that you were measuring. Can you still open that in the single beam editor and look at the five parameters or two parameters at a time? Is that yeah, you you have to see two parameters at a time in right. the single beam editor thirty two bits. So it's still it's still on the 64, you can see up to 9. Oh, okay. so if you're using the, the, the new one. one. The last one, right. Up to 9. Up to 9. Okay. At the But that's only in the 64 bit editor. Right. That's great. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yes. Do it four times to get it yourself. Does the interface RS232 or RS232? I think going into high pack should be RS232. Is it RS232 or SK12? Yeah, it's RS232. I think it should be RS232 for, for our side. So once the data come into the computer, Network. I mean, I've used the uh, Moxa sells the serial to UDP right. converters. So you can plug in a serial device, so it'd be a this RS-232 line typically going into those and convert it to UDP to send it over network, so you can get a little more range off of it. Um, or you can plug that right to a Wi-Fi device and, and be able to send the data across. <laughs> there are also the serial modems that you can use, to, in my experience. But I think the SCI 12, uh, Brock, do you know anything on that? Uh, I'm, I think in our instruments, uh, the XO has SCI 12 normally, but for something like this. Yeah. Typically by the time it's going to plug into a laptop, it would be uh, RS-232 coming out on the serial 9-pin port. So. Yeah, and the device hardware, you just specify what the device connection type is, and you tell it whether it's a serial or Ethernet, or if you're reading from a data file, for example. And then you specify the protocol that you're using, you know, so baud rate, 
flow control parity and all that stuff. Over, it's UDP over Ethernet, you know, then the IP address and UDP port. But we're pretty robust in that uh, ability to read and from multiple ports and even read multiple uh, data streams off of a single serial port too. So you could be reading off of one serial port, read it into one device <coughs> driver, set up another driver to read from that same serial port and be bringing in different data that you wanted to view from that same port. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of functionality we've developed for the, I think we support some 400 devices right now <coughs> with very widely varying formats from proprietary binary and, and then uh, ASCII outputs and things that, that come in for different devices. But if there's a new device or a new data string that you need us to be able to support, um, it's usually a relatively quick job for us to do. And so you can contact us at HiPAC, either send something to help at HiPAC or, uh, yeah, if you got Jerry's line, yeah, you can call Jerry, but either sales or help at HiPAC. And don't worry, just because you send it to sales doesn't mean you're going to get a quote for it. Um, <laughs> so the sales at HiPAC does go to a whole community of us. Uh, Carlos monitors that. I monitor that. Uh, Boris, who came in and took a picture for some reason, he monitors that. Uh, we got a team there that's always keeping an eye on it, as well as Gerd, the, the uh, operations director, is also watching the sales director, uh, the email. So you send an inquiry over, we all catch it, you know, we all get to see it, and then uh, we discuss how to handle that properly especially when it's an inquiry or a request for a driver, then that falls into our sales purview as to how we want to handle that. You know, if we see a broad use for it, a lot of opportunity, then most likely it's something that we're going to put into our roadmap and get it completed, and uh, usually pretty quickly when it's something like a device driver of just parsing some new message, it's usually a pretty quick task for our programmers to do. Um, if it's something you want specific for you, you've got your own device you made in your garage, and you know, this and that, we may actually have to ask for some payment to get that done. Um, but for these applications, that's uh, going to be a very rare situation where we actually have to ask for payment to get something completed like that. Making a note of it now. Okay. Add it to Gen Dev Hall. If you're used to working with HiPAC, and like you're saying, if uh, you've got some some uh, ASCII data strings coming in, so they're text strings that are coming in from your sensor, then we have a generic device driver. So it's a parser that's built into HiPAC. You can open that up and say, okay, read from COM1 uh, the data coming in, 
and you can look at, okay, here it's showing during the test what kind of messages are coming in, what they look like, and you can set the parameters in this gen parser. Um, so you can only set two parameters at a time in that parser. So the way that's designed, it was initially developed as uh, for dual frequency echo sounders, of course. You know, so people who had uh, multiple frequencies that they're using from an echo sounder, and it presumably it would only be two frequencies. Oh, nice. Ah, I heard something about that actually. Makes a lot of sense. So let's see if we can open that up for nine parameters. And I mean, yes, it may be a little tedious to set up, as has been one was suggesting. Okay, well, you can run the gen dev parser in one instance to look at your first two parameters, another instance to look at another two, and another two, and another two. If you want to get all nine, you've got, you know, five instances of it coming in. Um, one value is you save it to the I and I next time. Should remember. We should be able to. Well, it's something we can do, I'll say that much. Let's just see what timing. We can have that. Ready. I appreciate that feedback. I made a note of it. We'll look at it. You know, like I was saying, when you're sitting there uh, from the environment of an office and with a group of programmers, and, um, and okay, here's, you know, arbitrary sensor X comes in and well, you know, can we read the data from this or not? And how do we best do it? So, you know, apply the best, you know, the, the root logic and the easy path is often for high pack, yeah, the core has been on single beam echo sounders. And so it's, it's modify a single beam echo sounder reading uh, functionality for this multi-parameter sensor. And typically that was only two frequencies at a time. So it would support two parameters. Um, but it takes us getting some feedback to expand our thinking outside of that box, out of the closed kind of closed-minded concept-based uh, programming, and, and open it up to really serve what the needs are and requirements. You know, I looked at this sum as well and said, well, if there are 10 or 20 parameters coming in from my device. Uh, do I really need to be recording and processing 20 parameters or? You know, am I interested in making a map of what my battery voltage was? Am I interested in making a map of, you know, both the specific conductivity and the conductivity? Or the, you know, which parameters do I want to, would I really deprecate at a certain point and really want to bring out? You know, would I want to map conductivity or would I really want to map the, the salinity that it might be computing and providing to me? Um, so these are some of the things I've been... Uh, So I'll break into some of the development we've done for ADCP work. Uh, so ADCPs, the Acoustic Doppler Current Profilers. This is really a, an area of a lot of development, a lot of interest, and I think it really took a lot for us to take the first step into this. Um, while I say first step, I think there's still a lot more work that can be done. I'm going to start with a presentation about in situ ADCPs. So these are stationary monitoring devices. So if you've got something that's on a mooring, for example, a lot of times these are either bottom mounted looking upward, or they may be on a mooring looking downward, or like somebody had mentioned, you put them horizontal looking ADCPs, or they may be point sampling that a lot of people will put on a mooring. You know, they're just looking at velocity at a certain relatively singular point in space and monitoring that. Uh, what do these do? They provide you with current, right? They'll provide you with current direction, 
They'll provide you also with the amplitude or the intensity of the echo strength, which can be used relatively as a proxy for turbidity, right? Uh, it's hard to get right to suspended sediment concentration from that without very extensive sampling, and pretty routine sampling, uh, repeated, continuous sampling. It's, um, you know, because a lot depends on grain size and composition of the material, uh, what frequency ADCP you're using as to what the response will be. And some of that, if you're running off of batteries, will also change with the battery voltage. So the echo strength you get back can change as a function of what your transmit energy is from the ADCP, which isn't always a constant. So there are a lot of challenges that tie into that, but you can very quickly and readily interpret data from an ADCP as a relative proxy for turbidity based on the intensity. And I don't know how many of you have worked with ADCPs, but with, uh, with taking an ADCP and driving across a river, for example, looking downward, you can create a full cross-section of that river populated not only with the current velocities, so with most ADCPs today will give you a three-dimensional velocity vector at roughly every one foot bend as you go across that section. So about every 30 centimeter depth, or every one foot, if you're using something like a 1200 kilohertz or so, somewhere around one megahertz ADCP will provide you that kind of resolution going across. It'll also provide you the backscatter or the intensity of the echo strength as you're going across there. So quite readily, you can see a plume over here. You'll see where sediment is rich passing through. And over here, you're seeing nice clear water where there's very little echo in the water column until it hits the bottom. Now, a lot of that, in my previous talk, I explained how uh, the sediment reflectivity, the response or the backscatter off of sediment uh, on the seabed is a, fact, is a factor of the frequency that you're using. All right, so if you use a low frequency ADCP, for example, you can ping right through a lot of sediment and you're not gonna see the fine particles. It's not gonna get a backscatter until it gets a particle that's large enough and relative to the length of the pulse <coughs> or the wavelength that that unit's using. So the lower the frequency, the larger the particles it'll require to get a backscatter response. And the higher the frequency, the finer the particles will give strong backscatter response. So um, some companies have gone in and gone with multi-frequency ADCPs to try to make a way to, to look at different types of sediment composition. You know, do you have fines? Do you have coarse grain sediment? Um, from what I've heard here in the dredge application, uh, from what I've gathered, it's mostly about the kind of a core turbidity. Um, I don't know if we've gotten to a point of actual sediment concentration in the water column. Uh, and maybe some of you could answer that better for me. Uh, does, excuse me? No, I think that's almost a, that's almost a major research project each time. Right? And I don't know how practical that is. And, and I'm not well versed yet on what the standards are uh, for the dredge operations. Um, but are they based on like kind of NTUs of turbidity? Is that what they are right now? No. Well, we don't have much more to go by yet. So at least it's relatively practical. Right? <laughs> it's good to hear. So and I'd like to see if there's some opportunity to start working into the arena of, of maybe using ADCPs as a proxy for their turbidity and if that would be acceptable toward the standards going forward. Um, that could be a very interesting area uh, because as you can imagine then you're actually mapping a full curtain you know and you could have either bottom mounted ADCPs looking up or you put out a mooring that's just monitoring these areas you're getting the current and you're getting the backscatter or you could go with like a unmanned surface vessel that's out there that's actually mapping, you know, creating a whole screen across a, a section and being able to map the entire cross section and see where the plume may be and what concentration, what level it's reaching. Uh, but, you know, 12 years ago when I was working with ADCPs, it was not possible for me to get to that final point of saying what the sediment concentration was based off of the backscatter. I did another project up in the Russian Arctic and we were surveying and it was 25 days of continuous operation on a Russian icebreaker. I was the only American on board and I was in charge of the ADCP. I had a 10 meter pole I had to lower 
every time we got on station, and that was every three hours we did a station for 25 days, going 24 hours. And it, it gave me a fever about two weeks into it, and I just had to keep working through it. And I'm chipping ice off my ADCP to lower this 10 meter pole down, secure it into place, run into the lab, start collecting data. And uh, occasionally we're just doing it at each station we stopped at, and then the chief scientist allowed me to leave it down and do a cross section from Siberia to Wrangell Island across the, the East Siberian Sea, or Chukchi Sea, I think it is, to Wrangell Island and try to map the velocities across there. And it was quite amazing seeing a clear thermocline. I could see this kind of this uh, backscattering layer, you know, where all the planktors were hanging out. It seemed a nice scattering layer. And then he came in to stop on a station and put the ship into full reverse. And it's a 100 meter medium class Russian icebreaker. He put it into full reverse, we're in 17 meters of water. And I see the bottom stir up, the thermocline's totally gone. And then all these Russian scientists put their sensors in the water and start sampling the Arctic water quality. And I said, whoa, and I raised my, you know, I yelled to the chief scientist, come look at this. And I play it back. And he calls me an idiot, says, I don't know what I'm doing. This is totally irrelevant. And, I'm not going to disprove, you know, 10 years of his 1,000 stations he's been sampling every year, you know, based off of some, some college student that just happened to, you know, get a glimpse into this. And, uh, you know, by the end of that, we had another case where we stopped on station, and I see a big plume travel by the ADCP, and I'm like, whoa, look at this one. And all the scientists run down, we look overboard, and one of the Russians says, et the macaroni, sto, et the macaroni, and da, da, et the macaroni. And we run to the, the galley and find out, yeah, they just dumped a big pot of macaroni over the side <laughs> while everyone's sampling water quality. So they actually on the ADCP captured a plume of macaroni. And so I planned to, at that point, I was going to write a paper called The Macaroni Effect about driving in, you know, a big ship in shallow water and putting it in full reverse and suspending the sediment. And I thought, well, I better wait till I get off of the ship and get out of Russia safely before I start on that one. So it didn't seem like I was going to make it on that path. But it's an interesting case and an interesting area, I think, for, uh, for a lot of research. I know a lot's been done since that time, um, but um, I think there's an enormous amount of potential. And it's very clear on an ADCP when that backscatter, when the sediment starts coming into the water column. It is difficult to separate out air bubbles versus sediment, but with the air bubbles you can actually see some blanking you know, in the water columns. It's blocking the beams entirely. Whereas often when it's sediment, you're just getting some, some relative intensity reflections off of the particles in the water column. And I think there's a lot of value potentially in that. Um, and I'd, I'd be interested in a lot in feedback if, if some of you all have some ideas and thoughts going forward. So I think that's a real area that would be very easy for us to work in and would give a lot of information and very comprehensive detailed information for operators to know what's going on. Anyway, I'll get on with what we can do currently. <laughs> um, so if you're familiar with ADCPs, they're firing sound out at various angles. You may have a sonar head with, with four beams traditionally that are pointing into four different directions, so 90 degrees from each other, roughly 20 degrees out from the nadir, from directly below, so looking out at an angle. And what are called Doppler profilers, right? They're sending sound out in this direction, and they're measuring the Doppler shift of the echo coming back, right? The Doppler shift you know, they often refer to a train car, right? So a locomotive. And if you think about a train coming toward you, right, it sounds like a as it's coming in, right? It's getting higher and higher frequency as it's approaching you because the sound is compressing and the echoes that are coming toward you are actually getting shorter and compressed. So it's a higher frequency. There's shorter and shorter wavelength because that sound is coming back compressed. And when a train is going away, it's right? And it's going away from you, the wavelength is longer and so you're hearing that longer wave is a lower frequency. And so the ADCP transmits a signal out at a fixed known frequency. When that sound hits particles, it listens to the echo that comes back off of those particles. And does the wave, is the wavelength compressed or expanded in that echo, right? And that tells it, are particles traveling toward the transducer or away from the transducer? And once you do that in four directions, now you can compute. If you assume it's the same in the entire volume that all four of those transducers are sampling, now you can compute a three-dimensional vector, right? And if you do that at every interval of the water throughout the water column, now you can stack them together and put arrows together through the whole water column and know in this volume, this sample, this cylinder of water, at every one-foot interval, I now have a velocity vector 
And if I do that and drive across a river, for example, I can compile all that together and compute exactly, well, quite precisely, how much water is actually flowing through this cross section, right? And this is used a lot now, and it's kind of common usage. When I started this back in 99, working in that arena, it was relatively new, and a lot of people didn't know much about ADCPs. It was just one of those new four-letter acronyms, you know, that's, you know, just getting used to AD, uh, GPS, you know, and now you throw a four-letter acronym, you know, it's hard enough with just three. <clears throat> um, so it was another one of those kind of uh, black magic tricks that people were playing, but now it's kind of common usage. And I think it's about time we start making more use of those, uh, that technology and develop some real software for supporting it. And, and people don't have to sit with MATLAB and Excel sheets time and time again. Uh, those days are, are nearing their end for routine operations. Leave it to the researchers, right? So for HIPAC, we read the data from various ADCPs. There are multiple manufacturers out there. Sontech, it's part of uh, Xylem, is, is part of our family of companies in Xylem, as is HIPAC. Uh, Sontech is one manufacturer. There's also Nortec, there's Teledyne, uh, they all produce ADCPs. There's also Roe, is now a uh, relatively new guy on the block. They actually all came out of a core single team of, of engineers that have since kind of just dispersed and started their own companies over time. Um, but there's quite a variety. So here's the M9, so you can see nine transducers. This has two frequencies for ADCP simultaneously operating, or you say, they ping in sequence from one another, plus this middle transducer, right? So that middle transducer, what do you think that's for? Depth. For depth, yeah. So you've got a single beam echo sounder basically built into the middle of it, and you've got two frequencies for ADCP on the outside operating. All right, so that's what we call the M9, or the hydro surveyor, right, from, from Sontech. So we can support a lot of data from them. And you see something here, the Nortec Aquadop, single point current meter, so that's got is it like three little transducers, it's on a stick, and it's got a little battery pack typically, or it's wired up, and it's sampling at one point in space, so it's giving you a vector of water flow in that one location, so you can, you can map that very readily. So in HIPAC, the workflow is setting up the import parameters. So we'll walk through a little bit of the, the setup here for those interested. So you can enter the station information, you provide the metadata, so this is versus what USGS would be doing of filling out a little sheet at a cross section and saying, okay, here's the location, here are the, the information about where I am, you know, again at the same cross section that I do every week, um, or at every different flow, you know, interval that I can, I need to map. Um, we provide the orientation of the instrument, so is it up, down, uh, you can provide title information, and this again is for an in situ sampler, right? So this is either moored or fixed to the bottom. It's in a fixed location. It's either looking up, looking down, or looking to the side, or point sampling. You can set the interface detection parameters. So uh, related to backscatter echo strength, does it have a pressure sensor on it? Uh, do you have tide data? Uh, are you doing bottom detection to determine the, the depth? Right? Uh, you take into account the date and the time shift and correction, so synchronizing it to your GPS typically, or to local data if you want for time. There's that pressure sensor for the depth, and there's a calibration process that you can go through on that. Uh, we can support the temperature, the salinity. Uh, is there a sound speed sensor? Most of them do not have uh, a true salinity or sound speed sensor on them. A lot of them just measure the temperature and the pressure. Uh, also, is there an attitude sensor? So providing heading. Right? Is it a compass heading or is it using some kind of a other heading source? Um, you can have roll pitch sensors on board, so knowing what the orientation or the change in orientation over time, especially if it's hanging on a mooring. And then we go through the display and export. So this is the processing of the data from it. And so how to validate and invalidate the data. And that's based on the parameters that you're recording. So with the, you know, based on time, if there are jumps in time or something, uh, based on, you know, duration of time intervals, um, based on the different parameters you record, the roll pitch, you know, did it fall over or go 45 degrees over to the side? And you don't really want to be measuring over there. You really want to be measuring only plus or minus 10 degrees of roll, for example, or 10 degrees of pitch. Um, and then the uh, display of the current data. 
So you can do manual validation, so pointing and, and clicking and filtering the data out. Um, and then based on direction or vertical velocity and on backscatter echo strength. And then you can save in high pack format or you can export to ASCII files, uh, ODV file, which is a kind of a uh, database file and uh, or for research applications. <coughs> so to launch that, you go into the ADCP uh, application here in IPAC shell. So under tools, it's ADCP. You can go over to profile, so that would be like a vessel-based operation where you're mapping discharge, for example. Uh, or you can go into ADCP in situ, which would be from a mooring. So for in situ, here's an example of the interface. You've got a dialog box along the top with configuration parameters. The file open, it'll tell you what file name you're working with. Um, these little arrows off to the side, you can advance or, or go back to a file. So you can go forward or back. And the X, you can delete the file out so you're not working with it. It's not going to delete it from your database. It's just going to delete it from your workspace <coughs> environment. Uh, here's for uh, uh, some information, parameters. I'll go into more detail on each of these as we go through. Uh, and when you save the data from the, from the system, it'll automatically save it right into your projects folder. And as you're going through this, it'll store an INI file to remember what your settings were from the last time you operated the system to, to use those and apply them if you choose for next time. So in the in-situ and the shell, like I said, you know, importing, you know, going forward and back, uh, so this is typically used from, so when you collect the data with HiPack, we'll create a log file as well as all the raw files. So when you go into processing, you can either choose to operate on the log file, which will give you all the files contained in that, that period of a survey, or you can go one file at a time. So we talk about loaded from a log, that's what that means. Um, yeah, so the little folder with a question mark will give you information about the raw file you've loaded, so some of the parameters and metadata. Uh, you can go to data tables and view the data as a spreadsheet, or you can go in and view the data graphically. Then uh, you can save the raw data in an edited file in HiPack, so it doesn't modify the data, the raw data you brought in. It actually saves it as a separate extension and the, uh, as an edited file. Uh, and you can export, like I said, to ASCII or a variety of formats. <coughs> And then you can always access the help menu from there as well. And help menus are often very, very helpful. And I use them quite often in, in high pack. A lot of them are very well written. And if you find some errors or problems in them, then send an email over to help at highpack.com. Use that feedback to get those resolved as soon as possible. So for the import parameters, when you go into this, you click on that icon, it opens up a settings window. You can set up your station ID, the latitude and longitude. Uh, you can set up your hydrographic depth, so I'll tell you, we'll go into that a little bit more uh, shortly. But that's basically the depth of the water column. And then what instrument depth, so how deep do you have the instrument itself mounted? So in this case it would be, is it uh, you know four meters off the bottom or four feet, depending on the units you're working in, and you set those up in the, in the shell of high pack. And then the orientation, is it looking up or is it looking down? Right. And then you want to enter a tide file so it can reference the tide so that it's not mapping uh, relative to its, its uh, range, but maybe relative to the water surface and a distance off of that. So then, uh, yeah, you can go into station settings. So in here, you know, like we already just talked about all these parameters. <laughs> and again, showing uh, pictorial, whether it's up looking or down looking. And then uh, if there's a water layer that you want to export, so this will allow you to subsample the water column. So for example, if you have an ADCP on the bottom looking up, say through 50 meters of a water column or 50 feet of a water column, depending on the parameters you're working in. In this case, it had a 50. So you're, uh, I don't know if they left or came in. <laughs> so you're looking through the water column and you say it's you know 50 units of meters um, and you only want to subsample that to, in this case, they're showing uh, 10 to 30 meters. So you want to just take a section of the full water column of only 10 to 30 meters. So you just want to use 20 meters of the water column to really do the analysis on and, and process. Um, and then whether you want to use hydrographic depth or not use hydrographic depth. 
And uh, yeah, so then if you're if you do not select hydrographic depth, you'll be using the water level, and then you must have a tide file associated with it. So I'll show you a graphic relative to that. So measuring at hydrographic depth, you're looking from the bottom up, and you've selected in this case uh, 10 to 30 meters. So this is a 20 meter portion of the water column that you're evaluating the current velocities from, and also the intensities. Uh, you've selected measure hydrographic depth, um, so therefore you're looking only between 10 and 30 meters. And what's shown at the top is what the water surface would look like, you know, with a tide that's flowing through, and it's an arbitrary tide because you're measuring hydrographic depth. And in this case, you've not selected measure hydrographic depth, so you have to enter a tide file, and that way it's going to track relative to the water surface according to the predicted tides, or if you already have the tides measured, you can input those in post-processing, and it'll be looking relative to the water surface according to the tide, what it was running. And so you're looking depth below surface at a, as a constant versus height from bottom as a constant. Right. In this case, they changed the parameters in this pictorial to, uh, let's see, 30 to 40 meters, so you're just looking at a 10 meter segment, right, relative to the water surface. And this is with measure hydrographic depth not selected, but they've changed it to 0 to 10 meters. So you're looking from the water surface down 10 meters following the water surface, and only looking up uh, close to the water surface. Now in, in reality, there will be a certain blank distance at the very surface of the water where you have the air interface you're not going to get usable data right at the air interface. Very similar to looking down, you're not going to be able to use the data right at the bottom. Um, but it's, it's as close, about as close as you can get <laughs> now with any technology. Um, that's a function of the ADCPs. Uh, so here you can apply your time shifts. So if you're collecting the data and you need to apply an offset to a local time zone or you want to go to the you know, to GPS time, you can synchronize your clocks and apply the offsets here. Um, you know, if there's a drift, I hope not. Uh, then you can you can compensate for that here. There, there are certain parameters of time you can compensate. So I'm making a shift as well. Um, so it automatically corrects for uh, for the units from Sontec, Nortec, and RDI right now. So that's so it's already taken into account. You don't have to worry about the time shifts. Um, so relative to time, if you're not very familiar with how the ADCPs are sampling, what's shown here is, a, is kind of a, a burst of data. So what they'll do, in this case, the system set up for an average interval of, of uh, 90 seconds and a profile interval of 600 seconds. So for 90 seconds of profiling, it's going to continuously sample, and it'll take the average for that 90 seconds. And from the start of that sampling, it'll wait 600 seconds until it starts sampling again. So this reduces the data volume that you're collecting. A lot of times the in-situ monitoring systems will be with a, with a data logger on board. So you may have limited battery and data storage capability. And so these will make a burst sampling and bring it down to just one, you know, one uh, profile basically for that period of averaging and then it'll wait a certain period of time. Instead of continuously sampling and collecting a lot of redundant data streams, um, it'll sample a burst, get an average, wait a period of time, sample the next burst, get an average, wait a period of time. A lot of times these bottom mounted ADCPs will be out there for you know, maybe 30 days or more at a time. And so you don't really want to have to sit there and sift through or process 30 days of, of profile data when, uh, let's see, this is a range, this is a, this is a one megahertz system, yeah, so it's a 1,000 kilohertz. It's probably got a maximum range of about 20 meters. Um, you know, those tend to sample something around twice per second. So if you leave it out for a month and you're sampling twice per second, you can imagine that's a lot of data you're collecting. And if you're out in the open ocean, you may not really need two times per second continuously for 30 days to monitor, you know, what, how the weather shift, how the tides shifted. You know, so you break it down into something more uh, more palatable when it comes to processing later. If you put the put a little effort in on the planning on the front end, you know, it's another one of those cases where it saves you a lot more effort and time on the on the backside. Uh, another mode, and so this is showing with a. Uh, I don't remember if it shows what model, but anyway, uh, in another mode, you could be sampling continuously. So here it's running at uh, Ping's Per Ensemble. 
And if you're not familiar with the ADCPs, yeah, an ensemble will typically be a, a sample, right? Or a, a packet of samples. So this is doing by pings, so 180 pings per ensemble, and then it's 180 seconds per, per ensemble. So it's running this full period here, that's the full time, it's pinging continuously throughout that period, and it'll take the average, and then begin again immediately afterward the next packet. So those will be, you know, so it'll ping for a while, take an average, ping for a while, immediately afterward take the next average. So it creates kind of a down sampled time series that's relatively continuous, or it contains continuous information in there where you're not missing something. Um, so then you can go through calibration. In this, in, in this case, we're looking at uh, pressure calibration, so converting the pressure data over to depth. So you can calibrate for that when you do the installation, and I think this is also in the post-processing. Yeah, so this is in post-processing, you can do this. So you can compensate for local atmospheric pressure. And of course, if you're not familiar with working with pressure sensors, you've got to consider what the atmospheric pressure is at the time of an installation. You want to calibrate the relative sea level at that time. Um, so if you know you're installing it at a, at a fixed depth, uh, then your pressure sensor, you should be converting the data over for that depth. For example, when a low pressure front goes over, you know, if you're out in a hurricane, for example, uh, you're going to have extremely low pressure in the atmosphere. Um, and that's going to make it look like the unit is, is shallower in the water column. And if you have a high pressure, beautiful sunny day, which is more common when you're installing a device like this, um, then it's going to be high pressure and it's going to make it look like it's already one meter deep or so before you even put the unit in the water. So you want to apply that offset when you do the installation so that it's measuring relative to the actual uh, water depth. Uh, again, calibration process. So here we're going through the tabs from time, pressure. The next one now is temperature. Uh, I don't think many of these really allow a value for calibrating temperature, but it's available there in case it was supported. Uh, you can also do for salinity. Here in salinity. Um, yeah, and this can vary based on manufacturer, of course, as to what device you're using. So use a little caution when you're running through these steps. And then sound speed, again, which is very similar to doing the salinity calibration, kind of a two-point. Uh, so you're setting up kind of a, a curve. This is going to be a zero crossing. So you got your, I don't know, what is it, y equals mx plus b for the, you know, the equation for a line, right? You get the slope times the, times the x value uh, plus the y-intercept. So one of these parameters is the y-intercept, the other one is the, the x value for that given uh, point in time, or the, the slope and the y-intercept, right? So it scales what the, what the angular variation would be and what it's relative to. Um, but typically these, uh, these equipment uh, do not have sound speed sensors on them. Um, like I mentioned before, the temperature or, uh, or conductivity sensors perhaps. Uh, you can go through the magnetic uh, calibration for the compass on board, so make sure the heading is aligned for the magnetic variations that are in your area, so usually a hard <coughs> iron, soft iron kind of calibration, you know, and that's so if it's rotating around, uh, it's taking the measurements, then, then as you're passing through uh, <coughs> different interests, then you can calibrate for those uh, here. So this big polynomial down here, that looks like a lot of fun. But these are the parameters that you would input if you want to go through the calibration of the compass uh, through the uh, through this interface here. And otherwise, you can enter the magnetic declination. So this will be that's kind of like your magvar, as they call it, in surveying. You know, if you're uh, working in in a chart datum and from true north versus what the local magnetic offset is at that point in time. So you can adjust that shift in there. Uh, on old NOAA charts, you would look on those and it would say on this date, the magnetic variation is this. True north is here, but in this location, at that date, the magnetic variation may be you know, some 10, 20 degrees, and it'll say plus there's a shift of so many degrees per year, or so many seconds per year. You'll have to apply to that shift for what the magnetic variation is locally um, relative to a compass heading versus true north depending on how you want your data output to come and how accurate the true north you want those results to be. 
And then you can save your configuration file. So once you've done all that hard work, you probably want to save the config file, right? And you'll be able to reference that later. Now we'll go into the data displays, which I think are a lot more enjoyable. <laughs> so we have the options to display data tabularly. So when you collect the data here, um, looking at the various parameters. So these are per, uh, per sample. So here we're looking at, uh, this is relative to time. It's, yeah, time, you have the tabs across the top. It shows here a time, temperature, salinity, speed of sound, pressure, heading, roll, and pitch. So you can tab through the samples and see what the actual raw data were that were collected. And you can use this to manually go through and validate or invalidate the data you collected. So it'll flag it as valid or invalid. Um, you can also apply filters on these as well. So you can do an automated process of going through. Like I said, if you want to kill anything that's got a roll of more than you know 10 or 20 degrees, anything that's got a pitch that exceeds a certain threshold, you can set those parameters as filters. And, and invalidate data so they're not used for the, for the final output uh, working. Um, yeah, and so you can open multiple spreadsheets at a time so that if you want to look at one tab and how it correlates against the other, if you want to look at, you know, so here they're showing raw speed versus raw temperature versus say uh, this one is has pitch, so pitch, speed, and temperature, why you'd want to correlate those and see if there's some kind of a, a pattern between them. You know, every time my pitch exceeds a threshold, my velocity seems to spike or go down to zero, then I'll start knowing what threshold I want to set for my filtering criteria by you know, manually correlating the data across. So here's some steps on how to validate and invalidate. You can do multiple selection, hit shift. Uh, so hit shift, you can select multiple rows and then hit delete and it'll val invalidate those rows of data. Uh, and if you simply hit delete again, it'll revalidate those rows. So it's, it's something that you can turn it on, turn it off pretty readily as you go through the process. Um, and then, uh, yeah, to validate all the lines, whether or not they're ticked or not, you can uh, make a multiple selection and then press the escape key and it'll go ahead and select all the, all the values. And if your graph is open, uh, you must update for your spreadsheet edit. So, so right click and simply say, so when you right click on it, you can refresh the graph and then the graphical display will update according to what you've done on the spreadsheet for your validating and invalidating. So as you've gone through and, and remove samples or, or brought samples back live, just right click and say refresh on the spreadsheet and your, uh, or on the graph and your graph will be updated accordingly. We'll go ahead and show what the graphical display looks like in a moment here. So you can right click on the spreadsheet to ac access the graph. Um, and then you can also graphically select. So pressing the control key and just clicking and dragging, you can select data from your graphical display. So like in here, this person had hit control and just selected all the data here. You can see as it was measuring, what they're showing is a parameter of pressure. So they're graphing pressure along here. And at a certain point, the pressure sensor dropped out, so they probably took it out of the water. And so at that point, they said, well, we want to kill the last you know, portion of that tidal cycle. So they just went ahead and highlighted at this trough at low tide, perhaps, and, uh, and selected everything afterward to delete and invalidate all that. So you're not processing all the, all the data from when you retrieved the ADCP or stop using it. You can zoom in and zoom out with your mouse wheel and such, so a lot of, a lot of capability to pan around and, and look at the data that way. So then you can go in and filter, like we said. Uh, so here you can go and filter based on pressure, temperature, if you have salinity, you know, the heading, roll, pitch, um, and then uh, setting a scaling. And then, yeah, so you just go through the tabs on the filter. So this again, uh, Going through the tabs here, you know, based on pressure, you can enable or disable. And this, I think this should be overlaid on top of there, sorry. Um, anyway, you can go through the parameters here for pressure and uh, clean that up basically. Put that out of the way to see. There we go. <laughs> and the PowerPoint edits. So here, yeah, so you can enable, set a minimum, maximum value, and whether you want to apply that to the raw or the corrected data. 
And then we get into now processing and display of the current data. So that's after going through kind of the, the attributes about the data that were collected and setting your filters accordingly. We do a similar workflow when it comes to the hydrographic data. So when you're out there surveying, right, if you want to set it by your GPS quality code, you can flag your data as invalid if your quality gets below a certain threshold. You know, if you're not running RTK fixed, and you don't want to collect data or process any of the data that weren't collected with a fixed RTK, you'll go through and set that, your navigation parameter. You'll go through your motion sensor and set what your thresholds are for using hydrographic data according <coughs> to your motion sensor thresholds, right? So it's a similar kind of a workflow pattern um, that you go through here. So now we can get into profile display. So you can bring up the profile and actually look at the data you collected. So this would be looking from the bottom toward the surface. This is the up-looking unit. You're looking at a, a slice here through time. And so it's got the values of time across the top bar. And on the left-hand side, on the y-axis, you've got the depth. Right? You've got a little slider on the bottom, so you can just simply slide through your time series of profile data across the bottom. Um, the color coding here is set with velocity. So right now we're looking at velocity parameters. And over to the right here, it shows that this is easterly velocities. So velocities in the east direction, positive or negative, uh, ranging from, and uh, right now it's showing from negative 500 would be red, and positive 800 um, would be purple. So here we've got a lot of values somewhere, probably in the you know 400 or so, positive 400. I'm guessing these are uh, millimeters per second, probably. And then a lot of values over here. So you can see as the tide changes, you've got the tide Right, going positive to the east in this blue section, and in this yellow to red section, it's going uh, negative east, right? So it's basically going to the west, so it's shifting from easterly current to westerly current, right? And going through its oscillations again, back to the sine curves. Spoke ad nauseum about in last talk. Then <clears throat> you can go into the setup, so changing parameters on how you want to display the data in that graphical display we we're just looking at. So here you can set your depth axes. So how do you want a separation of the tick marks and the labels? Um, you can separate the time axes. If you look back at this, a lot of times are a little bit stuffed together in some of these cases. You know, in the beginning you can read this is one hour, 40 minutes, 30, uh, three hours, 20 minutes, five hours, and it's kind of busted up. It's a little bit hard to read. So in there you may want to spread out those tick marks and give a little more space to read. If you're working with 30, 30 days of data, you don't necessarily need a tick mark every minute, right? And, and work along in that regard if that's not necessary for you. Um, yep, and you can set up a, this is an interesting area, setting up a surface line. So the surface line you can do based on pressure, based on a bottom track if you were looking down, or tide if you're looking down. So here in this case, uh, based off of pressure, um, would be the blue line. Uh, bottom track would show up as white and tide would be red. And then you can go in and set up your colors. So what you want your color scales to be based off of, so that display we looked at, that was looking at east velocity. So you can go in and start looking at, based on speed, what do you want your color scale to be from negative to positive? What colors do you want to be, have? And uh, what the scaling should be. Based on speed, percent good, magnitude, correlation, direction, or amplitude. Those are all the different color, pal uh, color displays graphically you can you view the data through. And then do a surface detection. So bump thresholds, this is going to set a bit of windowing for when you're detecting the surface. And uh, as you go through the data. So then you can print the graphic, do a graphic print of the data. You can save the display to a bitmap. Um, you can zoom in and out on that display. Uh, you can go back to your filters dialog and apply re un unapply some of your filters. And you're going to delete data, so you can go in and actually select data for being deleted out of the profile. Um, and then you can go back to a data viewer. Uh, oh, the data viewer yeah, will give you the information about your cursor position as you go through. Um, so like we said in the profile display, we were looking at the east velocity display, the color, the color display for east velocities. You can look at north, vertical, error, magnitude, direction. Um, you can look at correlation between the four beams, so one, two, three, and four correlation. And you can look at the error of the beams, uh, the velocity data. You can look at amplitudes. So for some of the dredge applications, you'd be able to look at the amplitude uh, cross-section or time series there in the graphical display. So let's then look at percent good. 
And so going through some of the settings here and the profile colors, so like we said, so here in the top, we're looking at the east. Down below, we're looking at direction. And notice how you can set up a different color palette for each of the different parameters, which is kind of nice. because You don't necessarily want to look at 0 to 100 for the east velocity, whereas you might want to use that for the, uh, for the percent good, for example. Um, so you can correlate some of the events and the anomalies that you're seeing, which is kind of nice. So then when you look at, uh, for example, I would probably look at the intensity. You know, so have one where you're looking at the amplitude in one display and then look at your velocity in the east or the north and see where it correlates. So is it during a flood tide or an ebb tide that you start seeing sediment uh, plumes coming through uh, from this more data set? Um, so then like we showed before, so looking at a surface line, this blue line is based off of pressure. So it's the pressure that's being read at the sensor on the bottom. And the red line is based off of the tide. So if you inputted a tide, if you had input a tide uh, data set, it's showing what the tide is that you entered versus what the pressure sensor is telling you. And like we said before, if you click on a single value out here, you can get all the data for that value, for that cell that you're looking at. So this is showing the record ID, what the heading, pitch, roll, and velocity correlations were at that point. Also give you the time tag at that point, uh, which cell it is, so the ensemble and the cell. Um, it'll give you the velocity values, so east, north, up, uh, so vertical and error, as well as the amplitude, the correlation and percent good, the magnitude and direction of the velocity there. So a lot of information that you can pick up out of uh, working through the data set. Um, we can also do profile and time series, so you can extract out profiles from the data set. So in this case, you're looking at, uh, at profile number 234, we extracted out that profile, and we're presenting here, like in red is the east velocity, uh, let's say green is the velocity north, yellow velocity up, and blue velocity magnitude. So very quickly you can start seeing what are the dominant velocities that you may actually want to be looking at in your display. You know, if you're in a channel that's an east-west channel, it may be a little bit irrelevant to look at the north-south velocities. You may be more interested in looking at the east-west velocities. Uh, and so here you would correlate between the magnitude. So you see velocity magnitude is in blue, and that's pretty tightly correlated with the uh, velocity north. So it looks like the north velocity is dominating right, the, the total magnitude of the, of the velocity. So it's mostly north with a little bit of, I guess this would be south because it's negative. Right, so it's a south velocity with a small positive easterly component to it. So it's a south-southeasterly dominant velocity in that profile right there at this depth point. And here you're able to look at a time series for all those parameters as well. So just looking at a simple average of the profiles. And uh, there's a scatter plot view. So you can look at a single profile as a scatter plot. So this is going out in depth. Radially out from the center is depth. So range from the sensor. And seeing how the velocity increases as you get out from, uh, and then from uh, this is direction, uh, direction and speed, sorry, as you get away from the sensor. So it's looking at a single <laughs> profile direction. And then over here, we're looking at direction versus amplitude for the entire time series. So you're just selecting time series or profile. And if you select profile or time series, you can click on a little play button, and it'll kind of play through all the data you've collected so you can see what the distribution were uh, for all the data you would had out there. And like we mentioned before, there's that uh, Nortec AquaDomp, the point samples. So this is looking at time series of point samples of data from the AquaDomp. And so that's why it looks like just vertical stripes because it's no longer a profile, it's more or less a time series of information through there, but through the same kind of visualization uh, window. So it's very consistent with the way you would work with the data uh, from the profiler. And again, we can use filters or also the cursor, but this is now on the graphical display of the data. So you can go through and apply filtering and edit on the graphic data. So you'd simply click that filter icon we saw before up in the toolbar at the top. And you can apply filters, again, based on velocity, amplitude, correlation, percent good, or the magnitude of current. Uh, and just by clicking the enable box, you activate those filters. You see the tabs across the top, and you can set what parameter and minimum maximum values to apply filters with.
Uh, you can invalidate data by, by simply each cell type or by the full profile um, or by a certain depth level. And so that's set up in the, uh, that's defined in the, in the setup window. If so you're going to there, you can find those parameters. I looked at that. So validating in the profile display. You can go through here and, and validate data in the display window um, by simply checking the box to enable the cursor. And then you can go in and, and this is showing removing data by cell, again by level, um, or by full profile. There's also an ADC player. So in here, it's kind of a point cloud viewer. So in 3D space, you can look at a curtain of the velocities. So these are sticks of length and showing the magnitude. And you can hit play and it'll actually show you uh, through time how the currents were changing, so what direction and what the amplitude was of those currents over time. And you can zoom, you can pan around, um, scale in and out, and, uh, and typical tools for viewing those areas. And you can save the data. So you can save the edited data as we said before. And that saves the parameters and all the, uh, the processing that you'd applied. Uh, and you can also export the data as we described before. It's just simply saving with an export. So this is how the data may look as you brought it in. So when you brought in the data, you're seeing both, uh, as you can see in here, you see a signature of that area. That's actually the surface that it's hitting. And that's without any filtering above the surface. So that would be the raw data coming in from the ADCP. As you're hitting the surface. And beyond that is just a, it's a multipath. So you're hitting the surface and then it's kind of dispersed data beyond that surface, but it's actually just echoed back down um, what it's continuing to collect after the it hit the after the sound it hit echoed off of the surface, um, and you can go through and uh, so there's some parameters here to apply. So this has you've selected now display surface based on none. So that's why you're seeing everything above the surface. So you can choose to apply tide, amplitude, bottom track, or pressure, like we saw in that other dialog box. Apply those as uh, the criteria for determining where the surface is. seeing here. And if you base it on amplitude, you can see where it cuts off at the surface based on the amplitude received from the ADCP. If you do it based on pressure, we saw those lines earlier, right? the red line and the blue line, you can do it based on pressure and it'll cut off there. This E2 data, which is uh, some format to meet criteria standards um, for, I'm sure it's some environmental agency that uh, requires E2 format data output, so this will give you the, the formatted output. So if your organization requires data output in a specific format, you can let us know and we could, we could provide that output capability as well. You can also do ASCII output, so you get a full text file output of all the data and it comes a little parser so you can go through and review. And here you can do ODV exports, so you're actually getting contour map exports of the time series data from it. So here it's showing velocity magnitude, the direction, and the correlation average. So you're able to get that information um, in a nice simple graphic display and see it all. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for uh, participating in this water quality uh, training segment. And I hope that was beneficial to you. It was certainly nice for me to gather the information, your feedback about your interests and uses uh, expected for uh, for working with with the HiPAC software. Um, we do have some other capability for the profiling and discharge, uh, which I'd love to go through with you at another time. Uh, this has been a, it's been a pleasure to go through this with you at this point. Um, and I'll just leave you the with a little sample of going through collecting some profile from data from a vessel the mount the profiler. ADCPs. Inside the driver there are three tabs, the chart tab, the text tab, which will show textual information about the velocity, and then the settings. Users can preload the settings or update the settings to the instruments at any time by making changes. In the chart window, stop will stop the flow of the ADCP. Go will just resume it. You'll see that the color-coded bins displayed with the depth information to the side. Under settings, I can get to the color coding for the velocities and make adjustments to suit my own purposes. Over here is the DVL. The DVL is used for a navigation device when I want to use the ADCP body.
bottom track to navigate for short periods of time. Over here is what's being graphed. I can have the total velocity, or just the horizontal component, or just the vertical component. Down below, I can have my vessel, so it's a pointed vessel up, or under the settings, I can also do it north up. Currently, we're just inside the uh, hardware program testing it, so it uh, doesn't have any vessel heading information as my vessel, the vessel stack up there. Each bin then is displayed right, with its directional information and is magnitude color coded. This information gets saved to ADP files, which can be used to process the data. So this is real time vessel mounted data that you can collect with IPEC, uh, for example, for discharge measurements and such. You can plot the profile, cross sections, compute discharge, uh, and go through some of these features and functions. We'll be glad to go through that with you in more detail and discuss with some of our programmers if you have more interest afterward. I appreciate your time and thank you and I hope you enjoy the IPAC 2020 training.